Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the panel uh, discussion on the interplay between markets and companies and what uh, can be learned. Um, my name is Bo Becker. I'm a professor at the House of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. And with me on the panel um, are Jules and Itai, uh, who just gave uh, these great keynotes and don't need any more uh, introduction. Also, let's see, uh, Friedrich is the CFO of uh, one of the biggest hygiene companies in the world with a very long history, but also some exciting changes recently as the forest part was divided from the consumer goods part. And uh, Fig has a very long experience of what's called big company finance. Um, Linda Wogan works in corporate debt market at markets uh, at f in um, what is Finland's largest bank and used to be Sweden's largest bank. <laughs> 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 but it's uh, also the Nordic region's largest bank. Um, and so she knows a lot of uh, what's on the other side of capital markets, the uh, banks and financial intermediaries, and that will uh, be an interesting perspective on the panel. Uh, finally, Robin is one of the founders of Leo Vegas, which is a mobile gaming company, uh, which is less than 10 years old and has been on the stock market uh, maybe around five years. And so his recent experience of being an entrepreneurial uh, company, uh, interfacing with a whole different set of investors than the mutual funds, pension companies, and insurance companies, and hedge funds who are in the public markets, uh, and in a very different type of industry from where Friedrich works. So that will be an interesting uh, combination of perspectives. And so what we hope to do is talk a little bit about the different ways in which capital markets, both the stock market, the credit market, also private capital markets, send signals to companies, what they mean, how they're interpreted, when they go wrong, when they're off, how to deal with it, and what lessons can be learned from that. I th thought we'd just begin the panel by asking the three panelists who did not give keynotes uh, to give an example or two or some thoughts about how markets can be right or wrong, or more or less correct in how they price uh, financial securities, how they uh, receive uh, companies, and how they think of them. So, yeah, maybe Friedrich, to begin with you. Yeah, uh, thanks, but I, I can't really give a specific example. I, and frankly, it's always a difficult question because it's, uh, it's, it depends on who's actually right or wrong, you can be, as a management uh, team, you can be surprised about market reaction. It's too big or too small, and you think that the market is wrong. Un unfortunately, it may prove that it's you that's wrong and not the market, which is uh, kind of depressing when that happens. But generally, uh, I think what we see from time to time is overreactions. Uh, when, when people interpret uh, quarterly results in a much wider context and, and much more long-term than, uh, than they should, uh, so, despite efforts to explain how uh, how things are impacting or what they should expect and not expect, they may overinterpret, and you may have a very very positive uh, reaction, as an example, or or uh, vice versa, negative, without really if, uh, underlying arguments for such reactions. You you'll see after. Typically, as you progress, uh, a more corrective uh, movement, but that's kind of it happens from time to time. Mm. Yeah, so, so that's the closest I think. Not not necessarily one specific issue, but generally. Mm. Linda, we were talking before about how credit markets, yeah, maybe not, you know, get one company versus another so wrong, but that could happen too, perhaps. But also over time, credit markets, ten years ago you know, would land at interest rates that sound astronomical. Yeah. And now there's, I saw some number yesterday, 17 trillion of debt worldwide trading at negative yields. Mm. This can't be, can't be right. 
Uh, no, I, I can and can't, but I guess if we take that example now with negative interest rates, of course there is a hunt for yield uh, among credit investors. And I mean, what we see is they tend to seek more and more risky options uh, to cover up for this negative rate. I think another example that we discussed was during the financial crisis as well, when we saw CDS spreads peaking at extreme levels. And the question again is, you know, of course that was the market price to get rid of the risk, but the underlying fundamental risk in the companies from a credit perspective is your ability to repay debt. And from that perspective, I think the pricing was more about uh, illiquidity in the market for this instrument. Mm. So, two examples, yes. Robin, how about you? Well, I could take an example, the, the kind of opposite to Frederick, and I would say that uh, after our IPO, uh, uh, when we published our quarter results, first time, second time, nothing happened. We were spot on, on uh, track. Uh, we were delivering this, what we considered fantastic growth story. We were respecting sort of uh, the share price skyrocket, but nothing happened. Then I realized it wasn't until the third time we delivered the same result, same story, that it ticked off. Ticked off. Then suddenly it was that this like all in effect. And I've been reflecting quite a lot on that. And it, felt like it wasn't a story that was, was different, uh, but we need to gain the trust that we were actually doing what we were telling everyone to do. Uh, so therefore, one could reflect that, well, were the market wrong for the first three or four quarters? Uh, maybe so, or maybe... Uh, uh, but, but with that said, I'm glad we didn't listen to the market response. Instead, we con continue to stick on our story mm for a few markets until the crest, uh, trust was given, and then sort of you had that sort of effect of the hard work. Mm. Great. So I thought uh, we'll make room for questions about halfway through and then again at the end. So if anything uh, we discuss raises questions, you can make a note, you can even wave. Great. So let's move on to uh, one topic that I thought would be interesting to hear what everybody thinks about. And that's how you uh, sort through all the movement in market prices, how you should sort through it. If you're a company, the stock price, price of credit, it moves for all kinds of reasons, macro stuff that has nothing to do with you, or maybe it does, trade wars that may or may not concern you, and so on. Um, how do you decide which information is relevant and how to deal with it, or how should you? And is this a hard problem, or is it easy to get right? Uh, maybe go from Jules and just uh, go through the panel if, if you have reflections on this. Yeah, so let, let me say a couple things about that question. Um, so I think it is fair to say that we have been trying to understand why stock prices and financial market securities move as much as they do for a very long time. And various theories have been proposed to try to figure out why they move as much as they do. But I also think it's fair to say that we haven't reached quite a consensus yet uh, on what the, what the underlying causes of this are. And so in many ways we need to try to uh, disentangle the effects from behavioral effects from investors where they might be under or overreacting to particular pieces of news. But it's also possible that um, even short-term announcements just say a lot about the firm in towards the future. And therefore, if a particular signal today is interpreted about large future growth prospects, then actually a large reaction is completely warranted. And so trying to disentangle those things is hard. Now to come back to the specific question of, well, what is really news about aggregate things versus firm specific things? I do think there quite a bit of progress also in the statistical tools that we have has, has quite been made. I think we're quite well able to, uh, ag to separate aggregate shocks from idiosyncratic shocks as they are called. Uh, and trying to understand those separately, is, I think, is also very interesting. But I think that there's quite a bit of evidence that on both those sides, there might be over and under reaction, both to the aggregate as, as, as uh, to, to the idiosyncratic news. And so it's, I think it's a very exciting topic to keep on studying for forward. Uh, and I think that particularly for firm managers, uh, for each reaction, uh, trying to learn as much from the market as one can, I, th I think, is important in the sense that I do think that there is often a message 
Mm -hmm. It might not always immediately be clear what the message is, but, but ignoring it and simply consistently keeping on saying the market doesn't understand what we're trying to do, I think might work once or twice, but in the long run, I think the, the, the market on average gets it right quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Jake, how do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, a simple, if you take investor relations work in just in general, or the infam it's our, my job, of course, to, to be as transparent as possible and to present what uh, a shareholder or, or bondholder actually will get when they buy that share. And by, by doing that, hopefully also to understand for the investor what to look at and what not look to look at. So, so hopefully, if you do that job real well, there should be a, a fairly consistent view on what's important and not important. Uh, I think that should at least theoretically be the case. So, so in our case, when you look at the external world and all the, the factors, whether it's trade wars or whether it's macro or, or GDP numbers or, or interest rates or whatever, I think the, the starting point for us has to be what is affecting our business long term and short term, what is important for us. And hopefully, if, uh, if we get that analysis correctly, then uh, we should be in sync also with the external stock market. It actually happens that if you take trade wars as an example, we get fairly significant uh, market reactions, not just for our share perhaps, but in general. Uh, we are hardly affected, as an example. We're hardly affected by the, the trade war as it stands at this point of time. But nevertheless, we can get very, very significant movements. And that's just an example of, of uh, one factor that we have to do a better job in explaining. So, so when we look at the external world, we basically have the starting point is our own business, what, what's impacting us. And then we look at those parameters and we try to portray that also to the external market and create that consistency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Itai, what do you think about this learning and... Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I think you put it uh, exactly right that there are multiple uh, signals uh, coming from the market um, and sometimes it's, it's hard to sort through them. Uh, some of them are about things you care about, others are about things you don't care about. Some of them could be informed, others could be uh, behavioral and, and it is important to, to sort of look at it and try to make the, the most uh, out of it that, that you can and that you, you feel is right. Um, y y you know, I, I, th I think there are particular events in the life of a firm uh, where uh, the attention is focused on uh, one thing in particular and it's clearer uh, what, what the message coming from the market is. Uh, and, and in my talk, for example, I mentioned uh, the, this episode of, of an acquisition. So you announce that you're gonna do an acquisition and you get a very strong market response. Um, and, and it's pretty clear that this is what it's about, right? If, if you make an announcement uh, uh, on an acquisition and the market drops by 10% uh, the next day, it's pretty clear that the market is trying to tell you something about the acquisition and not about other things. So, so I think those are uh, situations where uh, you can sort of focus attention on, on the market and, and try to learn from the market. I'm not saying that you always necessarily like uh, the, the response of the market or that you always want to follow the, the response of the market. But I do think it is uh, a, a signal, a piece of information that, that you may want to think about and you may want to take into account. I, I think what uh, Fred, Frederick said about um, uh, transparency is, is also an important thing uh, to, to think about in the sense that um, there is really a two-way uh, flow of information uh, from the firm to the market and from the market to the firm. And I think the way that the firm conducts its own disclosure and provides its own information will affect to a large extent what it will get back uh, from the market. Uh, for, for example, um, if the market keeps trying to guess things that the firm already knows, then whatever you get from the market is not going to be useful at all. Uh, let's say that you have uh, some information about the technology, about the viability of your uh, products, um, and, and you haven't communicated that well uh, to, to the market, the market will keep trying to guess it, and will, uh, the, the messages you will get from the market will not be useful to you at all. So in some sense, it, it is a good uh, practice to convey uh, information about those things that you know 
convey them to investors. Investors don't need to keep guessing, and then maybe you can get more refined signals, refined messages on things that you are still uncertain about and that you could potentially benefit from, uh, from learning. So it's like the market is like a dog. You have to train it carefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's one way to look at it, yeah. <laughs> or maybe we are the dog. <laughs> <laughs> We're all dogs, okay. Uh, Linda, the, in, the, in credit markets, the signals are particularly crisp. Mm. If you're a CFO, you can go. You can go. To, <laughs> you can call you and say, "What can I?" And you will say, "It's 2.4 yeah. today." Yes. No. But I think uh, I very much agree with what has been said. I think it's important, I guess, to understand what parameters will affect my firm and how will that inf affect my investors, and be clear about that so that you know what to focus on. Then, if you take the credit perspective, you normally go into these for a longer time period. So long-term perspective, I think, is important, and transparency. Mm. You, you have a lot of clients that are very long-standing clients of the bank. Yes, and I mean, I think that is, is a, a big difference as well within the credit sphere. So you have the banks, you have the credit investors taking the bank perspective that I'm representing today. Uh, I think we're quite sustainable, actually. So it's more about building trust, long-term relationships than one quarterly report. Mm. But of course, I mean, if it continues to be worrying signals, then you have to take it seriously, of course. Mm. Uh, but I, I would say that our horizon is a bit longer. Right. But you must have some difficult conversations with corporate clients when say when spreads are really high mm. they don't like the price at which they can borrow now the yields are very low they might be happy about the price at which they can borrow but less about the uh, the interest rate in their accounts with the bank there must mm. be some tough conversations occasionally with companies there are always <laughs> tough conversations with uh, with clients but i think uh, all in all, I mean, I mean, clients are sophisticated. They understand this. Um, there are pros and cons with mm. low interest rates. I mean, if you look at the bond market, it's it's at an all-time low. How long maturities you can lend? I mean, in the euro market this year, we have seen 30-year bonds being issued, and books are four times oversubscribed in average this year in the euro market. So, I mean, there you gain a lot. And I think that also comes with the other side when you have liquidity to invest, liquidity to invest then, then you have another kind of discussion. So you mm. gain some, you lose some. That's mm. the name of the game. Mm. So, Robin, how do you decide when the market uh, likes your stock because of you and when it's because of gaming or when it doesn't like you and when it doesn't like the industry? I wish it was only because they liked me, but that's not really the case. Uh, now I think it's really important to distinguish the share price in itself and don't be too emotional about it. Try to be add some kind of rationale and see what to look for, what to not look for. Um, for example, uh, information on what co countries to enter uh, is, is really something we can pick up from the market. Uh, how the market uh, evaluate the revenues from Germany versus Japan. That's very, very straightforward. That's, that's, uh, we can have a guessing game in the board or, or in, in, the, in the management team, but really we can, can get a lot of insights from the market. And that you can look at us and at our competitors. That's super, super huge, useful and that we can make actionable. At the same time, I think uh, it's really important uh, standing up versus the organization and being committed as an entrepreneur to your long-term strategy. Standing there and saying, this is where we're going. It may take three or four quarters to explain that this is, this is the, uh, the uh, land of milk and honey that we're, we're, we're heading towards. Um, uh, but they're being sensitive to what we can learn, but not emotional of saying, oh, they don't like me or they don't like us. I think that's, that's the, uh, one of the tricks to survive in the public market. This is what I tell my students about grades. Don't be emotional. About it. <laughs> See what you can learn, what information is being conveyed. Um, so, so, so Bo, yeah, if, I, if, I can, yeah. if I could respond to, to one thing. I think that also the trade war example was a very interesting example. Also, in terms of 
how wide your prior distributions, how much are you willing to update your beliefs depending on the information that the market is trying to tell you. If you look at economists as a trade group, I think most people would have said that any threat to free trade should essentially lead to tons of wealth destruction because lots of people think that what the wealth growth that we've seen is due to free trade. And then we see that there are these threats of these trade wars. And yeah, we see some stock market reaction, but it's a percent or it's one and a half percent. Is it really the case if the system of free trade would truly be under threat that then we should see such little reaction? I actually think that was at least my response. And so then again, the, you, I think it's important to try to learn from the market what, what they're trying to say. Either they're trying to say these trade wars are all bark and no bite, and therefore in the end nothing will eventually happen. That of course is particularly given the political situation we're in in the US, not an unlikely scenario. On the, on the other hand, it might also just force economists as a trade group to start rethinking how important free trade in the end actually is for mm. wealth creation. I think um, if you're in the European Union and you have very strong beliefs that the European Union needs to survive, you predict that Brexit will be the end of Britain. And then the market tells you in the end that if you look where stock market valuations are today, that maybe in the end it, it wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. So I, I think that trying to understand what the aggregated opinion of the market is, I think, it is very interesting. Mm. Um, to the students, I always say, if you have a disagreement with one person, then you can try to have a conversation. And mm. you, you can be right, the other person can be right. <laughs> if you want to disagree with as many people as there are in the market and their aggregated opinion, you need to be really sure of yourself before you say, I'm sure that they're completely wrong. doesn't mean that they can't be. Large groups of people have made very bad decisions collectively that were the wrong thing to do in the past. There's hurting, there was all those kinds of things. Mm. But still, it's an aggregated opinion of many people. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no worries about Brexit. Good. <laughs> 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 I, uh, was, that the, was that a forbidden topic? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just a joke. Um, <laughs> Robin, I wanted to pick up on what you said about um, the organization. So uh, the management team and the board, especially the CFO office, is also the interface between all that external information, macro, specific, whatever it may be, and the, uh, the company and has to say, oh, here's how we use all this information internally. Maybe we ignore it, we just run our business, we know what we want to do, or you say, oh, there's lots of things we l we're learning here, let's try to s use this. It may be great news for many people in the organization financially when the stock market, when the stock price goes up, it may be horrible news when the stock price goes down. There are many reasons you might want to think about how this information is used internally. Uh, I, think, I think it's a very good point. Uh, first of all, we don't use the CFO as the filter of information. I think on board level, in management team in general, but also, in my case, representing on the ownership part, we're all getting sort of very signals from the stock market. And then sort of what do we pick up on? Uh, a lot of people say information is everything, so, so take everything. But what really I would say is the man managerial skill is making information actionable making it actionable. And that's not only to pick out on, on what, uh, what things to listen to, like for example, uh, what countries to go for. Uh, but I think it's, it's also framing that information in, in a way that you can get the organization motivated behind it. Uh, you, you can't sta stand in front of, of your team and say, we're doing that because the market wants us to. We do it because we think it's the right thing. And we need to be able to explain why it's the right thing and how it actually relates to the strategy and vision that we presented the week before. Uh, so I think that's really the key managerial skill um, to, to gather, the, just as, or even more important, actually gathering the information, making it actionable in, in that, that, um, that sense. Felix, mm. uh, how does this work at SED? You have a huge company, many countries, to some of the employees, the stock market must be pretty far away. Yeah, it's far away. I, I think this is a super important question because, first of all, we we generally, hopefully, you've set up your your internal theory mechanism to to have roughly the same valuation drivers as as the stock market. So you should be in sync with whatever stock market and the management team should be roughly in sync of what to do and how to allocate capital or take those kind of decisions. 
But we actually use the stock market quite a lot because they are basically the owners. I mean, they are the, the owners of the company. So, of course, we use that as a communication device, mostly emphasizing decisions that we have taken strategically or, or tactically in the company. So, as an example, when we have our leadership team meetings with the 300 uh, top managers of the group, we always have a section where the uh, market representatives or, or I will do that, present what the market actually thinks. We do it regularly, also on a quarterly basis, and, and provide that opinion. We do it on board meetings and uh, in every group management meeting. So, so we use actually that feed uh, from the market to, not necessarily to, uh, of course, change the direction. That would not be uh, the right thing to do, but actually to emphasize and to provide that uh, insight into the company management, which is really, really helpful. So you're mm -hmm. right, yeah. you won't actually, you will never say, we're doing this because the stock market happened to think that's a great idea. We would never say that, but we will say, we have to do this and just emphasize, look at the estimates. They believe we can do it, hence we can do it, right? So, so we use it quite a lot. Mm. It's super important to have that flow both ways. Mm. Itai, did you have a...? Yeah. Um, no, I, I think it's really interesting to sort of think about what happens when a manager comes and says, look, the market tells us to go this way, we thought we should go the other way, but now we are going to follow the market. I, I agree that there are some implications there that could potentially be uh, unintended and, and, and undesirable um, because you don't want to sort of project weakness that you have your own models, but then you end up abandoning them and, and following uh, the, the signal from the market. I, th I think it's a really interesting uh, thing to, to think about. You know, for example, in, in my talk, I highlighted that policymakers have been much more forthcoming in their desire uh, to, to follow the market. And, and essentially, you know, if you go to the Fed, they basically say very clearly, you know, you should follow the market. If the market tells you there is a problem here, you should follow it. But on the other hand, when it comes to, to managers, um, I think they're much less uh, forthcoming and, and sort of think much more about what will be the consequences and if this, is, uh, uh, if, if the, if this might be a, a negative thing for, for leadership and for the effectiveness of the decisions going forward. Mm. If I may, um, I, thi I think it's a really, really super valid point. Why don't you make those uh, decisions? But I think. I don't think it's the risk of showing weakness that is the driver, because in Sweden at least, showing weakness can actually be showing strength. Uh, I th it's very much more sort of, I think, uh, the, perspec uh, I know the perspective in, in general among people what of the stock market. It's not considered to be, apart from in this room, so the positive force. If you speak to the people joining, entrepreneurial companies. They want to follow an entrepreneur or a vision. That, that's really what, what tied into uh, to them. While the stock market is often perceived as something hindering us to fulfill a vision. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is perceived often when, when, you t when you talk about that, that direction. That's why, I'm, that's why I think it's so important to take in all the information that you really get from, from, from the market. But take it in and align it to the strategic values that are, are the things that people generally follow. People that are not necessarily shareholders, people that work in a company, come to a company because they want to share a vision, build something. That's, that's the context, sort of. Uh, and I, I think that's uh, a challenge for, for all of us in this industry, uh, that uh, among people in general, the stock market is not perceived as the positive force. Maybe because it's used as an excuse to, to drive through un sort of unpleasant decisions and so on. But it's, it's not, while companies are driven and created by being the positive force, being the vision, being the entrepreneurial side. Um, so I think that that's the main reason uh, for, for uh, uh, not referring to stock market. It's not uh, fear in itself. It's like mm. that people are triggered by vision and traverse uh, more, more generally than, than but, applying with the market. But that is also overall the role that finance plays, right? There yeah, are very few yeah. people that go to the CFO to get the project approved and think that he's the visionary driving force of the project, yeah. right? So finance in general provides the discipline to the decision maker with the numbers. That doesn't mean that that can't be demotivating for the people that have the vision, but both can be true at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Both is true. That, that's, I think, a very nice way of framing. Both, both perspectives are true, 
But the driver, that's the thing that motivates people. When you present, we're going to go <laughs> this direction, needs to be added in some, some other sort of context, uh, which makes it uh, uh, harder also for academics to analyze why did we do these decisions, because mm -hmm. they're sort of presented in a, in a context not for uh, academics, but mm -hmm. for the people that are actually going to go out and do the job to mm -hmm. feel motivated. Mm -hmm. Can, can I also add one thing? I, I think your your point there, you don't change direction because the stock market would, would kind of, and you wouldn't use the stock market to change direction. There are a couple of decisions, though, I think, where the stock market actually has an influence in, uh, and that's uh, relating to, uh, uh, for instance, just as an example, more where you have different boundaries, like debt equity leverage is a good example. So if you have a very, very strong balance sheet, as an example, and, and you fulfill whatever capital requirements you have set in the board or whatever, there, I think, uh, stock markets uh, especially has, a, has an influence in the sense that if you get too much pressure on dele or uh, uh, leveraging up or, or making a special dividend or a share buyback, then I think boards in general and perhaps management team will be actually influenced by that. That was a trend, for instance, in the mid-2000s, and you've had this subsequent trends yeah. as well, when suddenly a lot of companies geared up simply because the return on equity was too low. Mm -hmm. So this is an example where the stock market would typically influence. Management mm -hmm. teams would be comfortable sitting with a war chest and potentially buy something. The stock market would not accept that and want to want you uh, to have more leverage. Mm -hmm. so this is one example. I think also structural moves that you are planning on making at some stage can be pushed a lot by external pressure from stock market. So it's just a couple of examples. Mm. Lina, but, uh, to switch back to credit markets, who, who's your counterparty who, or who is the counterparty to the bank? Is it also the CFO? Many large clients must have loans in different mm. countries, different subsidiaries. Yeah. Maybe credit markets are more sort of connected at many levels in the organization? There are, there are so many layers, and as we said, I mean, we build a broad relationships. We want to be everywhere. We want to be with the owner, we want to be with the CEO, CFO, and group treasurer. But I think on, a, on an ongoing basis when it comes to debt, it's the group treasurer mm. who reports to the CFO. But once it comes more strategic, and, and um, as you're pointing out, Frederick, for example, are you going to gear up? Is there a new financial target? Get uh, is there a huge acquisition or, or so on? Then, of course, it's a CFO and CEO level as well. So, it depends a little bit whether you know it's in the daily flow, mm. such group treasure level. Mm. Otherwise, it's, it's more senior than that. Mm. We talked a little bit about how the financial markets represent the bad news or the discipline, but sometimes the stock market is good news too. Uh, Jules, I think you pointed out that a lot of the potential welfare costs to mispricing might be when a stock price is way overvalued because you can invest too much. I think um, Michael Jensen, thinking about the tech bubble in the late 90s, talked about high, a high stock price as cocaine for corporate managers. It feels so great, and you'll do crazy things to keep that feeling going including, he was implying, I think, lying to the stock market. So even if it doesn't go that far, it may still be that there's a lot of positive things. Nowadays, in many companies, people's financial futures are very affected by these really big moves when they happen. This can really change the organizational dynamic, the motivation of the staff, and so on. Is this something that you think, is it different when the moves are really big? in the stock price, how you respond to it, how you deal with it. Robin, you must have seen some of that since you've been through an IPO, which is in a way... <laughs> no, no, but uh, I think that's... Uh, stock, pri stock prices are... can be such a small thing or such a big thing in itself. It really, really affects uh, people. But at the same time, t two people in the same room that are generally equally affected can have... Sort of so, so it's a great discrepancy in reactions mm. uh, and, and how, how sort of deeply involved it is. So it's kind of hard to, um, uh, to analyze itself. But generally speaking, I mean, when you, if you can motivate the, the, uh, the reaction because you've been consistent to a story 
and then suddenly f people get it. That, that, that sort of, that, then you get that, that feeling, that's the long, long term thing. While uh, the more uh, sudden changes or go erecting to a quarter, it doesn't have that effect. I think if you, uh, it's more of, of uh, getting used to seeing uh, uh, market prices go up and down. It, it's, it's, it's the name of the game, it goes with the territory. You need to react, you can learn from it, but you should focus your energy where you can make a difference. Mm. While a lot of people get in the trap, well, sort of spend your energy on things that are flux, where you don't make it actionable. So I think it, it much comes back to being uh, in close contact and touch with the market, but making the insights or uh, the information actionable is the thing where you then can be happy for the awards, mm -hmm. the, uh, the rewards coming, because mm -hmm. you sort of make it actionable and then sort of you can. Um, uh, can make something more meaningful uh, to it than just a number. Mm. Mm. We talked a little bit also about when you're in a positive spin and your uh, stock price uh, rally and you're experiencing uh, a lot of growth. Uh, I think it's also, being a banker, important to pay attention to financial risks. And that is something we actually see in um, quick-growing companies, um, entrepreneurial companies, where you spend so much focus uh, on growing your company uh, that you pay maybe not enough uh, attention to FX risk, rates, working capital, uh, and these kind of risks. So that's also an observation, I think, mm. that uh, you need to pay attention to. And, and when it comes to hedging, for example, as long as it goes your way, it's not a question that um, you may want to pay so much attention to. But when it doesn't go your way, yeah. then it's a lot of focus on that. But then it could be too late. So that is, uh, from a bank perspective, something that we try to emphasize as well. That would, for example, be when the Swedish krona is very weak at the moment. A yeah. lot of businesses benefit from that. But yeah. are they ready for when it comes back up, yeah. if it does yeah. ever? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, um, so so I, I think one thing about the stock price is that it's kind of a focal point. It's something that everyone looks at. and. You know, it affects the mood and the information, the way people think about the firm. Uh, but it also, everyone knows that it affects others. So I think as a result of that, it could have an amplifying effect on the behavior of people uh, in, in the firm. I, I, you know, people talked about um, the positive. When the stock price goes up, people feel good about it. I, I, I think uh, it also happens on the negative side. I mean, if uh, th there are a lot of anecdotal uh, stories um, whereby firms who are not doing well are getting close to financial distress, the stock price keeps going down and the way it affects the mood of, of employees and employees start thinking they don't have a future in the firm, start looking for other jobs. I haven't seen sort of large scale empirical evidence uh, of it, but you know, I, I, I have in mind a, a few examples where uh, the firm is, is not doing well, getting close to bankruptcy, and you start seeing the employees fleeing away. And when you talk to them, and, and they, they often mention the stock price as something that was kind of a key driver for their uh, the decision, uh, sort of the, the proof that the firm is not doing well. Mm -hmm. I think uh, adding to that, uh, it's, there are a few moments say, in growing company. For example, when we IPO'd, everyone could feel really, really, really proud. That was one, one moment, like uh, uh, in business life, there, there are few moments that you really can share with all your partners, suppliers, and it's, it's just a positive thing. And I think that, that's really uh, an extremely strong force. Also, uh, when we hit the unicorn mark, I mean, that was a big thing for the company itself. So sort of we created this unicorn and it had the momentum, getting everyone a close up, which actually had a positive spiral of, of uh, supplier relations, sort of uh, recruitment in general. It, it, is, uh, it is a force that uh, should not be underestimated. And it's an opportunity that really should be, be used. I mean, it's. It's fun. I mean, it's, it's, we all love when, when we can hit those uh, those uh, targets, and p people love being part of that sort of momentum. Um, so, uh, uh, so we talk a lot, a lot about the negatives, but if you once felt that, you really want to feel it again. Yeah. 
But, but, but to add to the large movements, I think one of the things about large movements is the salience of them. Right? And so one thing that we know about stock markets as well is that the ups are slower and the downs are faster. Mm -hmm. And so that unfortunately means that just due to their salience, the, down, the bad news always gets much more attention. If for a year time, every week, the stock market goes up by half a percent, that doesn't nearly get as much news as that in one time it drops by 26. Right? And, so, and I think that that's generally true, I think, also in the way that media reports, that it's harder to get good news across rather than bad news, because bad news always comes in bigger batches than positive news for some reason, not just in stock markets. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, th that could lead to a bias, and that's important. But then on the other hand, to, to come back to the earlier point, I mean, efficient capital allocation, unfortunately, also just means that bad projects don't get financed and that the plug is pulled when it needs to be pulled. And that's very painful, and that is entirely bad news, and nobody likes that. But as an entrepreneur, you believe in your product and there's only good things and you want it to succeed and you just deeply disappoint when it doesn't work. But if you're in the finance side, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad news that needs to be given, <laughs> I think. Great. I think um, we should see if there well, are... Just a, just a reflection. Yeah, go ahead, Frank, yeah. uh, you, you said... Uh, Someone compared to cocaine. Honestly, I have never tried that, so I can't. <laughs> I, I can't can, can make that fair comparison. But it feels great, I think, with a good share price, and of course, specifically relative valuation to your peers. That's mm -hmm. that's really very very helpful for retention. It is for recruitment. It is actually for for paying people if you have stock programs out uh, outstanding. I, I think uh, the weak side. Just a comment. I think typically when you have a, a painful journey with uh, with your stock for various reasons could be external or internal factors or whatever you got to do something and and so you actually do that and some of that stuff may be very painful it may be cost savings programs that will take out thousands of people or or really really be painful for the company but you got to do those things anyway regardless of the stock price it's just for performance reasons most oftenly when you do that, you get a fairly good buy-in for mm. actually doing tough challenges. That could be for, from unions or for employees or, or whatever. Most often, the stock market will react quite positively if they feel that's the right thing to do. And so the share price will kind of rebound and uh, eventually do that fairly quickly. Mm. And once you start executing, you will have a lot more resistance in the organization simply because people will look at the external market and say, well, here you are, the stock market is doing excellent. Why do we need to do all of these, uh, these things? Mm. So the so stock market can be very good to, to um, uh, maybe justify very harsh measures, but it can also create some difficulties in executing them. Mm. We have, I have uh, quite some experience of exactly this. And, mm. uh, you just got to get around that with lots and lots of internal communication. So stock market is much ahead. To mm. Already counting yeah. on you to deliver. Yeah, you've delivered. Practically, you show a PowerPoint and that's it. If you have enough confidence, you've delivered. And it yeah. doesn't work that way, unfortunately. It <laughs> takes a little longer. Taisa, we should try to open up for questions. Next to every chair, there's a microphone. And uh, we would like to record the questions. Let's see what that is. Yeah, Don? Uh, following up on the discussion on the bad news, uh, from what Drew was discussing, it is good for capital allocation as well, and uh, it, it's more efficient if the market disclose bad news. But the corporate managers may not like the bad news because it's a hinder what they are trying to perform. But what it, it, it was also trying to uh, in mention is that uh, the managers can train the market so that the market can uh, review more information on both the good news and bad news. And if this is the case, is there any way for the managers to also like incentivize the market to disclose more of the bad news and if this is uh, and also uh, whether this is at all in the interest of the managers to incentivize the man market to disclose more of the bad news so uh, are you asking if, if managers should disclose bad news or the, the managers should uh uh, so both, uh, uh, whether the managers, uh, uh, whether it is in the manager's interest to incentivize the market to disclose the bad news, mm -hmm. and if that is the case, is there any way to uh, promote this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is in, in the manager's interest uh, to, to do it. 
Um, you, you know, m maybe managers have some other motives uh, than the benefit of shareholders, so maybe they do not like it as much, but in general, if you think about the well-being of the firm, I think the answer is yes. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how, how you would uh, do it. I mean, I think that requires some more uh, thinking. Again, the way I was thinking about it is managers may want to be sort of forthcoming with information they have so that the market does not keep guessing and, and provide more information of that would be valuable. But, but on that particular aspect, I think it's more uh, complicated. Hello? Yes. Our topic is about the information from markets. and. Uh, uh, we have already discussed the bad news and good news. And uh, let's uh, take another dimension. Uh, I think about the news during the normal economic development and uh, new information during the financial crisis. And as a manager and the corporate uh, owners or entrepreneurs, how can you interpret the different information during these two periods? That's my question. And uh, another affiliated question is what's your a prediction of next financial crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the first question. So you, you contrasted the financial crisis. Or time, we have financial crisis. We have information during these two periods. Uh -huh. How can you deal with this uh, information set right. within these two periods? I think there may be some difference from the corporate perspective. Right. What's, if it is, what's the difference? And will you, uh, to be more specific, will you change your portfolio more frequently during the financial crisis? Because it's very, the high volatility and the stock price are very noisy. Or you will do more investment, or you keep cooler, you stay stable. What's your reaction? That's my interest, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, generally, uh, how to act during financial crisis, I think that's the topic in itself. But I can say from a, a corporate perspective, both bo board and managerial perspective, I think uh, it's all about agility, being able to actually act. You cannot... Um, me. I mean, it, it's, it's the wartime. It's those, those moments that we, we can experience once or twice in a lifetime. Uh, and I think, I think it's... Uh, uh, those areas where you need to act. You cannot be passive instead of financial. It's like I'm watching the HBO uh, Chernobyl series. You have a crisis, you can be passive watching it, uh, but it, that, that doesn't make it go away. I think you need to embrace it. I, need, I, need, I think you need to get into to, uh, uh, war mode and really, and it needn't be sort of external crisis, kind of internal crisis as well, but you need to be ec extremely uh, Hands on on it, uh, but then the financial information cannot be the main source. Well, it can be key source of information, but you need to have something that you get together. That is your DNA, your raison d'être. Take back your troops and see well, what what are what is we re what are we really about, and then scale out, scale away uh, the rest. So, because unless you have something to cling in, cling to during financial crisis, then you're just lost, and that can't can't be. be if, if you're not sort of in the cockpit steering it, then sort of the financial crisis, crisis will wipe you away. That's uh, that's at least my my philosophy on it. Yeah, but again, uh, during the financial crisis, I think um, coming back to transparency and this building the long-term relationships and being. I mean, funding is the heart in a company, at least from my perspective, of course. So very important. And, and when market, financial markets like the bond market stops to function, you're so dependent on your banks in, in, uh, in this example. So, I mean, I think that is also why we emphasize that the long-term relationships, you have to build them and you have to build them with trust. And I think this is a good example where, where you had to turn. And I think in, in this region, we were fortunate because the Nordic banks actually uh, had capacity uh, to help out a lot of corporates during these times. Um, so that's more the long-term perspective, that sticking to your portfolio of clients, at least. So that is something that wouldn't change 
from a bank perspective in that mm. situation? So mm. maybe part of the answer to that at least. I, I think it's a super good question, actually, because I, I think uh, when you get into a financial crisis, and uh, there has been a couple, I think the focus shifts a lot, so it gets into much more scarcity of capital, and, uh, and, and you reduce your, your capex and uh, basically austerity, and, and you focus a lot about availability of funds and costing of funds. So, so, so the communication to the investors or, or the stock market will change and the way you behave will also change, basically, which that's, that's, a good, that's a good thing. I think the trick is actually not the financial crisis as such. It's, uh, the trick is much more when you're not in a financial crisis because you have a really short memory. It's not only the stock market, but it's also internally. So, yeah, everyone thinks that there may be another one and, of course, we've got to be protected. But to actually maintain a robust uh, financial management in really good times, especially when stock markets will push you for lots and lots of investments, lots of gearing, lots of uh, growth-oriented uh, things that perhaps is, is a bit long-term. At that point, always maintaining the balance sheet strength or the preparedness for a financial crisis, that's super, super important and quite difficult. So it's more, I think, when you're not in a financial crisis, that's when the tough things, uh, the tough decisions have to be taken. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so during normal times, uh, when financial markets are very competitive, that also means that the prices are more informative, right? Or at least about the firm. Another way of saying Sorry. that is in the, in, the times, yeah. in the times that this other thing starts to bind and the capital constraint is there, it means that something else is influencing the asset price. And now you need to try to disentangle whether the low price is due to the capital constraintness of the financial system versus the actual news about the company. And trying to disentangle those two effects might therefore, you, you, maybe you have to take a bet against the market in that case because you think that you're undervalued for the wrong reason. You're undervalued not because of, there's bad news about the company, but because the financial markets are not operating properly. And so I think that difference is very important. Hmm. Yes, question over here. I, th I think one of the things we've noticed in financial markets is that like, the average holding period of a company is now much shorter than it would have been back in the 60s or 70s. So now we're talking about six months to nine months, depending on the markets, to multiple years if you go back kind of long enough. How is that kind of short-termism of investors going to be affecting corporate managers in terms of making their decisions? Do you think, do you think financial markets have enough patience uh, to, for projects that are multiple years to, to deliver on? Uh, or, or is it really pushing corporate managers to, to be a lot more short-term themselves in terms of the projects that they take on and where they invest? Short-termism. Yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I think the, sure. the, the first observation is that I think essentially everything has become more short-termist. I think that the labor contracts that firms have with their workers has become shorter. I think that the way that capital, the capital goods market works and the way that you can lease capital versus buying it and holding on to it is, is changing that market. Everything's becoming faster. Information processing is becoming faster. So the first question is, in the context of everything becoming faster, is this how much faster is this really? And then secondly, if financial markets are competitive and well-functioning, does it really matter who holds it? And under what conditions do we care about who the owners of the firm are in also in the strategic decision making and the voting that happens during shareholder meetings and other things? There, there may be some interesting things there. But uh, um, I, I, I'm not, not as worried. Uh, I, 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 I personally don't think that this short-termism debate is, is, is as urgent as, as some people make it sound. That, that's, but that's my personal opinion. I mean, I, I don't know if the short-termism has become a bigger problem over time. That, that's what I'm not sure of. I mean, it's true that maybe the investors are holding it for shorter horizons. But, you know, managers always had uh, this incentive to make the stock price look good in, in the short term. And, and, you know, there have been studies sort of looking at the effect of this on their investment decisions and, and the fact that maybe they want to forego some profitable long-term uh, decisions uh, just to make things look better in the short term. I, th I think that has always been there with uh, the interaction between managers and, and the stock market. Mm. Yeah, do we have any CFO comments about short-term? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the, sure. the long term is just a sum of a lot of short terms, so in that sense, <laughs> it, it, uh, I guess there's no, no real conflict. I mean, I've, I've been uh, working in positions like this for, for pretty much exactly 20 years, and uh, I don't feel... You're right, I think uh, there's been a shorter holding period. I think that's, that's actually quite noticeable. Uh, but from a decision-making style, I may be completely blind, but I don't think we are more short-sighted in decision-making now than we were 20 years ago, honestly. I, I don't think so, but... Uh, so it doesn't seem to have an impact. I may be blind, so completely wrong, but, uh, but I don't think so. I think it's roughly the same. Robin, you must have had some early investors who were very long-term. Maybe now, now it's different. Um, I would say yeah, we, we actually have quite a lot of the very early investors from, from the first seed round, which was in uh, mid-2011, uh, still on board. Uh, but when we IPO'd, uh, the, the people that's been, been with us a few have done 30 to 60 times the money. Uh, so naturally, most portfolios were quite a kind of unbalanced by, by that time, regardless whether they liked our vision or not. I mean, their, their portfolios had had unbalanced. So for us, IPOing was actually an opportunity to be less short-term oriented. At that time, uh, all, most gaming companies were very, very sort of uh, strong yield cases. Uh, you had high profits, uh, nice growth, but not exceptional. We wanted to do the opposite. We wanted a clear growth case, really, sort of shooting for the unicorn mark and building something. Uh, our DNA is, is really being number one in mobile, and we saw that really taking, taking off. Um, so IPOing made the people that didn't really want to, to uh, stay on in our vision, or at least not for their sort of disproportionately big portion of their portfolio, uh, they could sort of, the general was sell half and, and stay on for the half. But, but, but generally, uh, that avoided us to have the pressure to be like everyone else and be short term like everyone else. Uh, therefore, we could be drive at least for a year or two more sort of according to our vision what we wanted to do thanks to IPOing um, so that's that's uh, in our case that that's uh, that served uh, the uh, going public made us more long term than, than, than staying staying uh, private great we may have time for one more I might have one very quick question. So, so far, all the questions were about the time series, you know, whether news are more important in good or bad times. What we haven't talked about is about the cross section. What I mean is that whether different kind of investors uh, have more or less impact to the managerial decision process. I'm thinking about, for example, the short interest of hedge fund or where insurance companies are more, uh, the, the behavior of these kind of different investors have different implication for decision of, of managers. Like if managers, for example, care more about the short interest or where junk bond investors are more in effect for corporate uh, loan decision making versus standard uh, bond investors. Quite opposite to one we may believe. In our IPO, we really went uh, heavy on the US uh, and really making sort of a grand uh, IPO tour because we thought that we could be more long term with US investors on board than, than uh, of course, we had our, our Scandinavian anchor investors, but we thought we could be more long term. And how does that play? I mean, normally, it's, well, the general uh, perception is that uh, US investors would be more quarterly focused than, than Scandinavians. But we were a growth case, and there were no game and growth cases on Scandinavian markets. So therefore, by actually uh, taking more US investors on board, that aligned more to the strategic vision of what we wanted to create in that uh, IPO phase. So that could be one, one, one answer to that. Mm -hmm. Great. You know? Yeah, so if I understand your question correct, it's a bit like, so would different kind of investors focus on different things? What was that? Yeah. Care, what a managers care more about some specific types of yeah. investors yeah. than others. No, but, but you but see I, the market price yeah. is not going to get one. Maybe you can yeah. disentangle the different 
as yeah, I mean, and I and I think both Frederick and and Robin are, are surely familiar with, with this. But I think what we often tend to do uh, with maybe less experienced CFOs or group treasurers when they go to the bond market for the first time, for example, it's quite different to tell your story to an equity investor than to a bond investor. So an equity mm -hmm. investor obviously wants to see a value driver, a high multiple and, and so on. Whereas from a credit perspective, you want to be repaid. You want to get your coupon and you want to be repaid. So you tell the same story, but you have to twist it a bit so that you as a credit investor feel that yes, you can be aggressive, but not too aggressive. So that, that's absolutely right. There is different stories to tell, definitely. I, I can add, uh, yes. maybe, we, we love all our investors regardless. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's obvious. But uh, <laughs> uh, you, you can perhaps add that uh, the story that a company normally tells is typically perhaps a strategic one. That's a starting point, And then you'll update on on kind of tactical execution or, or short-term things. That's basically how it works. So, so, of course, that whole investor story is targeted to long-only investors, right? It, it's actually targeted towards that. So, so when you meet in hedge fund investors, which, uh, which I do quite, quite frequently, you, you will notice, because the questions become very different. There may be questions about peers or, or others that they'll take a bet on, they'll sell them and buy us, hopefully, or whatever. So, so there is a lot more volatility created by hedge funds, and the, and the questions are typically somewhat more short-sighted. Uh, so, so I think that the trick from an investor relations standpoint is to satisfy both those needs. Can always continue to communicate the long-term direction and the strategic execution that you're doing, but also be quite receptive to portraying a view on what's actually the immediate future, it, what, what's actually happening at this point of time, how are things affecting uh, in the next six months or a year or something like that. So th there's clearly a difference, absolutely. And I think also you have another dimension, which I think is really interesting when we talk about at least the Swedish market. So we, uh, in the forefront, I would say, when it comes to talking about ESG, and we have placed a couple of sustainable bonds now. And I'm thinking of one specific case during the spring where we had a room full of investors for a corporate and all the questions were in the area of ESG. So that's also quite interesting, I think, how you actually, in such forum, don't ask the questions so much about the financial performance, but actually about the ESG-related questions. So that could be another um, area of investors, as an example. Increasing a lot. Yeah. Definitely. In fact, la this is an annual conference. Last year's theme was sustainability. So academics are on board with this topic as well. You're Great. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we heard about it. Um, so we're two minutes over. That's about how late you were at the beginning. So that's perfect. Uh, thank you all for participating. And thank you especially to all the panelists for coming and uh, talking about this. Thanks.